Come and listen to my story about a man named Jed. A poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. And then one day he was shooting at some food. And up to the ground come a bubbling crude. Oil, that is. Black gold. Texas tea. Well, the first thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. The kinfolk said, Jed, move away from there. Said, California is the place you ought to be. So they loaded up the truck and they moved to Beverly Hills, that is, swimming pools, movie stars. The Beverly Hillbilly. Mr. Drysdale, sir, in my 40 years as a butler, I have served in some unique households and run athwart some bizarre families. But the Clampets, sir, if I may use one of their own curious expressions, take the rag off the bush. <laughs> well, now, I warned you that it wouldn't exactly be smooth sailing. To be precise, sir, you said you could only promise me blood, sweat, tears, and money. Right. I've had the blood, sweat, and tears. Now I should like the money. <laughs> You're leaving the Clampets? I'm leaving the country. <laughs> but you've got to stay with them. You're our cultural beachhead. Consider me another Dunkirk. <laughs> Pinkney, suppose you tell us exactly what happened. Must I? <laughs> it will help you to talk about it. Yes, perhaps you tried to force too much culture upon them too soon. On the contrary, sir, I started off in a very light vein. Fun and games, as it were. Good! I told them their lawn was ideal for cricket and suggested a match. And to my delight, they responded with a great deal of enthusiasm. Well, here we are. Of course, a regulation cricket match has 22 contestants. The field is somewhat larger. But the important thing here is what we can learn from cricket. What's that, Mr. Pinkney? To compete fiercely, to win modestly, and above all, to lose gracefully. In other words, good sportsmanship. Ah, that sounds good to me. And why are you wearing them big gloves and that thick padding, Mr. Pinkney? And carrying that big stick. This is a cricket bat, and I'm wearing the padding and the gloves as a protection when I do the catching. But I'll explain it as I go along. Are we ready to start the cricket match? Yes. Of course, back in England, ladies don't usually participate. We consider it a bit dangerous. I ain't scared. Me neither. Well, then let's get on with the cricket match. Here's mine. <laughs> Here's mine. Here's mine. <laughs> uh, hold on. Uh, Mr. Pinkney ain't had a chance to catch you, yet. Go ahead, Mr. Pinkney. Yeah, there's some dandy ones over there by the hedge. Good chirpers, too. Yeah, but you won't need those gloves and padding. You won't need that club. Our crickets ain't a bit mean. <laughs> this here's about as big as they get over here. <laughs> Don't you try to get away. You just may be a winner. <laughs> ain't you gonna catch you one, Mr. Pinkney? Yeah, and then we can go to matching crickets. Well, I got mine, but I ain't gonna show it until you get yours. <laughs> I've changed my mind. I do not wish to play. <laughs> well, doggone. For a fellow made so much of being a good loser, he sure took it poorly. <laughs> Thus ended my attempt to introduce the noble game of cricket. But I might add that rugby met an even quicker fate. What happened? At the first scrummage, Young Master Jethro kicked the ball into the neighboring city of Westwood. <laughs> get, get a grip on yourself. Yes, they just don't understand British games. Quite so. I then turned my attention to improving their wardrobe. Excellent. 
clothes make the man. Yes, but this time I decided to split their ranks, so to speak. Excellent. Divide and conquer. Yes, <laughs> I resolved to concentrate on the young people first. Excellent. The greener limbs are easier bent. Might we do away with the platitudes? <laughs> I beg your pardon? Granted. <laughs> well, first I must say, my wardrobe innovations met with dazzling success. Oh, yes. Quite marvellous, really. Do you like to ride, Mistress Ellie? Yes, sir, I sure do. Have you ever ridden to hounds? Well, we only got one hound around right now. Our old brown hound do. <laughs> now, before we progress sartorially, let us pause for a brief lesson at English pronunciation. Let me hear you say, brown hound. Brown hound. <laughs> now, uh, <clears throat> listen carefully and repeat after me. The brown hound sleeps soundly on the ground. Brown hound sleeps soundly on the ground. <laughs> now, listen again and say it exactly as I do. The brown hound sleeps soundly on the ground. The brown hound sleeps soundly on the ground. I think she's got it. George, she's got it. <laughs> what you got, Mr. Pinkney? Say it for your father. Well, he already knows it. Knows what? Oh, about the brown hound sleeping soundly on the ground. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do, Mr. Pinkney, but you can't hardly blame old Duke. He's getting along in years, and it kind of warms his bones to lay out in the sun. <laughs> I'm all ready to go riding, Mr. Pinkney. <laughs> hey, Ellie. You got on the wrong get-up. You're a girl. Well, this is what Mr. Pinkney told me to put on. I reckon you made a mistake, Mr. Pinkney. They are just alike. Perfectly proper, sir. They're both correctly attired. You don't say. Sure that, Jethro? Come on, let's go ride. Okay, but if it's gonna be a long ride, we better put some gas in the truck. <laughs> he didn't intend them to ride in the truck. You didn't? No, sir. However, tomorrow I'll get some horses. Oh, don't bother, Mr. Pinkney. We ain't even got a buggy. <laughs> oh, what an experience. Oh, it seems to me you have nothing to be discouraged about. You were making wonderful progress. So I thought, sir, I even persuaded Mr. Clampett to don the walking tweeds of a country squire. Magnificent! Bravo, Pinkney. A real step forward. And two back. Uh, what do you mean? Well, as I say, when Mr. Clampett made his appearance, I was highly encouraged. <laughs> excellent, sir. Excellent. Smashing. Thank you. Now, uh, what'd you say this was again? That is a shooting stick. That's what I thought you said, but dog, if I can figure out how to load it, much less shoot it. Oh, that's a good one, sir. Now, Squire Clampett, you're properly attired to stroll about the estate. Oh, well, come on, Granny. Just a minute. Granny is going to accompany you? Ain't that why you got two sets of these, just like you done for Jethro and Ellie Mae? <laughs> no use, Jed. I can't go walking with you till I take these in some more. My britches have done fell down twice already. <laughs> Might I have a spot of tea? Yes, of course. What would you like with it? Ticket to London. <laughs> ah, now, Pinkney, don't run out on us. Where is that vaunted British courage? Where is that British tenacity? That British spirit. Show it to us, Pinkney. Very well, make it three tickets to London. <laughs> <laughs> Tea, actually. Oh, thank you. Now, I really must be on my way back to England. Oh, please don't go. Those hillbillies need you. To paraphrase your great leader, never in the field of cultural endeavor have so few known so little about so much. <laughs> Sorry. Here is my account, sir. I've made it an even thousand pounds. Are you out of your tea drinking mind? That's almost three thousand dollars. You were only with the club. It's a day and a night. Yes, they gave you a lovely room and fed you. Fed me, sir. Have you ever partaken of the curious substances which Granny so quaintly calls victuals? <laughs> it does cook up some rather strange dishes. I have eaten in the jungles of Africa. I have shared the peculiar bill of fare of the Australian bushmen, Berber tribesmen, and Tibetan goat herds. 
but for pure culinary improbability, none approaches the loathsome cuisine proffered me by those hillbillies. <laughs> up for supper, Mr. Pinkney. May I assist you, madam? You may not. Around here, we wash ourselves. <laughs> I mean, may I assist you in serving the meal? Of course not. You're a boarder. Oh, yes, I tend to forget. Uh, would you allow me to select the proper wines to accompany our first meal? Howdy, folks. How soon we have middle, Granny? Pretty soon now. Mr. Pinkney here wants to have some wine. I reckon he's old enough. <laughs> you tell me what we're having, I'll choose a wine for each course. Well, we'll commence with soup. Oh, good. Vichyssoise, turtle, consomme. Catfish. <laughs> I simmer it in a good, hearty tadpole stock. Tadpole, madam? I don't try to find out how she makes it. Granny don't give away her cooking secrets to strangers. <laughs> some possum shanks with gopher gravy, collard greens, grits, deviled hawk eggs, little bite-sized owl burgers, and for dessert, candied crawdads. She's really putting it on for you. We ain't had a meal like that in weeks. How fortunate. <laughs> yes, you are. Well, Mr. Pinkney, what kind of wine do you want with that? I think the only appropriate beverage would be a large tumbler of hemlock. <laughs> what a gastronomic nightmare. Culinary reform should be part of your cultural improvement program. Oh, never mind that. I want to know what this $3,000 is for. That includes the cost of my luggage and automobile, both of which were impounded by the hillbillies. Why? You insisted I pose as a lodger. We couldn't tell them you were a butler. They're opposed to the idea of servants. In their case, so am I. <laughs> tell us what happened. Well, after a night of terror, during which my bedchamber was overrun with raccoons, possums, monkeys, and other weird vertebrates, I attempted, under cover of dawn this morning, to evacuate our cultural beachhead. <laughs> <laughs> Jethro! <laughs> What's the matter, Grace? Mr. Pinkney skipped out on his rent and taken our chickens with him. He didn't get far, Granny. Oh, and Jethro caught him. Catch huh? him back! <laughs> this is most ignominious. <laughs> I don't know if turn off your engine, Mr. Pinkney. You ain't going no place. <laughs> what should we do with him, Granny? Don't know yet, but I'll figure something. Well, figure fast, will you? This car's getting a mite heavy. As a punishment for my attempted escape, Granny put me to work making moonbeams. Making moonbeams? Moonlight? Moonshine? <laughs> yes, that's it. An ingenious distillation apparatus, something called a still. Well, how did you get away? Well, my guard, a large hound by the name of Duke, became intoxicated by inhaling the fumes. While the brown hound slept soundly on the ground, I escaped. Well, Granny, it looks like your boarder got away again. What happened to Duke? Looks like he sniffed himself up a right tolerable drunk. <laughs> you reckon Mr. Pinkney got his car and his suitcases? I don't see how he could, but we best have a look. Hey, Jethro, how about taking me riding in Mr. Pinkney's car? Can't, Ellie. Granny says no driving at the house. Still here, Granny. Well, as long as he's gone, put it back outside. 
Yeah, grab it in, Jethro. Reckon we'll have to tip it sideways again and get it through the door. Yes, sir. Then I want you to start painting me some new boarding house signs. Just like the old ones? Not quite. I'm making a few changes. Mr. Drysdale, sir, you're wasting your time. Once I retrieve my luggage and my motor car, I intend to put Beverly Hills far behind me. Now, if you'll stay a week, I'll raise my offer to $500. You Americans amuse me. You think money can buy anything. $750. Sir, there are some things that cannot be bought at any price. $1,000. Fortunately, I am not one of them. <laughs> Chief, look! <laughs> Granny's boarding house. Cash in advance. Pay now. No credit. No pay, no stay. Bring money. Chicken thieves ain't welcome. Pinkney, you hop out and take those signs down. Miss Hathaway and I'll go on up to the house and pave the way for you to move back in. Very good, sir. a tranquilizer for you. <laughs> What's that chicken thief stealing now? He just slipped something into his pocket. Granny, stop calling him that. He ain't guilty till he's proved guilty. Yes, sir. All right. Y'all ready to start this trial? Yes, sir. Are you ready, chicken thief? <laughs> This may set Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence back a thousand years. Don't worry, Pinkney. This is all playing right into our hands. Wait and see. All right, let's hear what all is being held against this fella. It is held against this fella that he skipped out on his rent, stole Ellie Mae's chicken, tried to steal Granny's boarding house signs, and got a 15-year-old falling down drunk. I object. What 15-year-old? That there hound dog, Duke. <laughs> and Kirk there blowed up my still. Ran off and left the fire burning. Well, hey, Granny, that ain't rode down. It don't count. <laughs> now, we heard Granny's side. Let's hear Mr. Pinkney's side. Your Honor, Judge Clampett. Now, nah, Mr. Drysdale, strictly speaking, I ain't a judge. I'm just here to see that this trial is kept fair and square and to keep Granny from shooting that rent skipping sign stealing chicken thief. <laughs> uh, Your Honor, uh, that is Mr. Clampett, the defendant, Arthur Pinckney, has decided to plead guilty as charged. <laughs> Two hundred foot start. I'll load my shotgun with rock salt and bacon rind and season his hindquarters for him. Yeah. <laughs> Your Honor, Mr. Clampett, I didn't finish. As his punishment, 
Mr. Pinckney would like to suggest that he be sentenced to a week at hard labor here in your home. Nothing doing. We don't want his kind around. Sit down. Granny, that ain't for you to decide. I think in fairness, we ought to remember the good thing Mr. Pinckney's done. Like what? Well, like uh, bringing us them fine new clothes. Probably stole them. <laughs> May I address the court? Sure, speak right up. I would like to say that I know Mr. Arthur Pinckney to be a man of good character, and I will vouch for him. I, too, know Arthur Pinckney, and he is a man of unimpeachable integrity, impeccable demeanor, and irrefutable probity. Thank you. Well, that's one fur and one against. <laughs> Sir, Your Honor, may the defendant speak? Hop to it. <laughs> Sir, I won't go into all the reasons why I want to spend a week here, but suffice it to say, there are a thousand of them. <laughs> Keep talking, Mr. Pickney. I do hope you say yes, sir. I can be very useful, really. I can do the shopping and the serving and the cleaning and the tutoring. And I can be everything from chef to chauffeur. <laughs> it's a deal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> really, that's what you call riding in style. It sure is. Too bad Jethro and Ellie May couldn't come with us. Well, quick as we get two more riding suits like this, we can all go together. <laughs> you look nice, Mr. Pinckney. Thank you, sir. Where to, sir? Well, right down through the middle of town. Yeah, Wilshire Boulevard. Hampton, sir, may I ask you a question? Sure, go right ahead. Is this the only motor vehicle you have? Yep. Would you like to have another one, sir? Oh, I guess not, Mr. Pinckney. Besides, I don't know where you'd get another one like this. <laughs> they don't make cars like this no more. I'll stake my life on that, madam. <laughs> Mr. Clampney, sir, when we're going down Wiltshire Boulevard, would you allow me to stop at a first-class automotive showroom? What for? Well, sir, that's where the finest machines are put on display for people to look at and buy. I'm sorry, Mr. Pinckney, but this beauty ain't for sale. <laughs> Very good, sir. I'll tell you some place you can stop. The supermarket. I want to pick up some sow belly to go with my dandelion greens for supper tonight. Madam, may I do your shopping for you? You know good sow belly when you see it? <laughs> I have something else in mind. I'd like to prepare for you a gourmet dinner. What do you reckon a gourmet is? I don't know, but if he fries it good in the lard, I reckon we can eat it. <laughs> All right, Mr. Pinckney, you can cook vittles tonight. Thank you, sir. Do Granny good to get out of the kitchen for a change. We shall all profit, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Now make yourselves comfy. I shall serve the coffee and the dessert here in the drawing room. May I ask how you've enjoyed the meal so far? The turtle soup, the lobster thermidor? Just dandy. Fine. Finger licking good. Oh, thank you. That soup we throwed out the window don't kill the flowers. How can anybody eat soup made out of turtles? Beautiful. And that thing he called Welsh rabbit. Didn't have no rabbit in it at all. Just a lot of doggone melted cheese. Wasn't too bad after Granny dumped the grits in it. What was it he called that big crawdad? That was lobster thermidor. That didn't taste bad, neither, once we poured hot gopher gravy over it. You don't suppose Mr. Pinckney caught on, do you? Shucks, no. He had it pretty near pitch dark in there. Nothing burning but candles. <laughs> Yonder he comes. The piece de resistance. Crepe Suzette's. Nothing but pancakes. <laughs> there he goes again. He's sure fond of the dark. What's he fixing to do now? He's lit another fire. Be careful, he's gonna burn this house down. Regular fire bunk. If that rascal ever does any cooking out in the woods, he's gonna... <laughs> 
Uh oh. I was afraid of that. He said the pancakes are fire! Don't know why panic! <laughs> there will be a slight delay in serving the dessert. <laughs> It's time to say goodbye to Jed and all his kin. They would like to thank you folks for kindly dropping in. You're all invited back next week to this locality to have a heaping helping of their hospitality. Hillbilly, that is. Set a spell. Take your shoes off. Y'all come back now, here. This has been a Filmways presentation.